Dad, can you explain what a solar eclipse is? <laughs> no, son. <laughs> We're going to talk about the evolution of stars, and it's going to hinge upon these concepts we've already been uh, looking at. For example, this idea of um, HR diagram and what the main sequence is. So I'm going to be drawing you this right here is the main sequence. And remember what's happening here? In the, a star that's in the main sequence means in its core it's uh, going through nuclear fusion, which is when hydrogen is being converted to helium. So that, that particular element. Because later on, the stars that are up uh, higher in the HR diagram, they can be converting you know, helium to other elements. But the one we need to focus on is hydrogen to helium. This is where a star is sitting when it's really happy on the main sequence. During that time, remember, um, it's in hydrostatic equilibrium. So that means the outer radiation pressure, you know, this pressure caused by um, E equals MC squared, but the fact that it's fusing stuff, uh, that causes an outwards radiation pressure. And that's equal to and opposite to the gravitational force that's going inward. So they're, they're kind of fighting each other. Now, stars spend almost their entire lifetime on the main sequence. And what I think is really important is this one, that the fate of a star depends on how much mass it has. So mass kind of tells you everything. So if a star doesn't have much mass, it's a very low mass star over here, then we know kind of what it's going to be like. If it's a higher mass star, we also know what its fate is going to be. So it's all about the mass. All right, so what happens after the main sequence? Well, it depends where it sits, but in general, here's what happens. Now, there's a lot of notes here, don't worry, I'm just gonna try to explain it. So what happens is this, can you imagine that it's run out of hydrogen in the core? Well, if it doesn't have that outer uh, radiation pressure, what happens? Well, gravity is still acting inwards, so you see it can't really push outwards, so what happens? Gravity wins, so it compresses. So you know, so that's why the core collapses. Now, uh, it might be to where it can actually then, um, maybe it squishes enough to where actually it can start fusing heavier elements. Maybe has enough mass to have sufficient density and temperature to where all of a sudden, boom, it can start doing nuclear fusion um, and making carbon and nitrogen and oxygen. Now, what, what's interesting about this is as the core collapses, it's really weird in astronomy, we call it the shell rule. You don't need to know it for your, uh, for your exams here, but just so you know, what happens is if the core gets smaller, the outer part actually gets bigger, which is counterintuitive, but there you go. The piece you need to know about is this, though. The outer shell will expand and cool, and because it's cooler, that means it gets redder, because remember, red is something that's uh, cooler over here. Now this particular HR diagram has way more detail than you need, okay? So just so you know, you don't need to know, you know, all this stuff in here. It's just to show you more details in case you want to know it, but we're still looking at temperature over here. We're going to ignore the spectral class. We don't care about those. And just like we're going to ignore the magnitudes, but instead its luminosity is better. It still looks like our old HR diagram. So if you just had this and this right here as your two axes. So what's going to happen to this, our sun, and I remember I said you don't have to know it in this much detail after this drawing. It helps if you know these points right here. This is what you should know for exams. So what's going to happen then is our sun, for example, it'll run out of hydrogen uh, in the core. So what will happen, this core will collapse. It'll actually, basically, it'll get bigger, but not more massive. It's actually more kind of wispy. So it's going to, of course, cool. And when it cools, it's going to become redder. So that's why it's going to become a red giant. Now what happens then, it all depends on its mass. So if it has enough mass, it can then, you know, start burning heavier and heavier elements. If it doesn't have much mass, and it'll just kind of stop there. So it really all depends. Here's an example. And again, you don't have to know this much detail on your exam. Like this drawing and this drawing right here are just for extra, just so you can kind of see more detail. Because I think it helps to understand a little bit what's going on. These are the points right here that you should know. Okay, for exams, these points right here. But um, so depending on a star's mass, it could go all the way up to iron. So here's an example of a really high mass star near the end of its life. So it's got lots of different shells. It's kind of like a, you know, an onion with lots of different layers. And the center maybe has like iron and nickel. Well, it turns out the core, it can only go up to iron. It can't go any higher. Now, why can't it go any higher? Well, we're back to our good old friend, the binding energy per nucleon curve. This curve right here that goes like this, where the peak right here is iron, that's Fe, it's iron 56. And why is that? Well, that's because, remember, we've learned this a few times, right, that fusion is going to be uh, energetically favorable because uh, for low mass elements, if you go, you have to go up in this graph. So if you go up, you're going to go right, you're going to have fusion. 
So what happens is this though, iron, once it has iron, it can't actually go up anymore. So you see from here, it can't go up anymore. It means it's not gonna be able to fuse iron. So what happens then? Well, it can't burn anything else. So that means all sorts of crazy things are gonna happen. It's actually gonna collapse inwards. And again, that's because it has a lot of mass, but it can't push outwards anymore. So what happens? All that mass collapses in on itself. And we're gonna talk about different versions of what it is that happens. But uh, what I think is really fascinating is this, that iron, for example, like that's often what makes stars blow up. So for example, how do stars uh, make heavier elements than iron? Well, when they do blow up, it turns out they go supernova, which I'll explain in more detail on the next slide. But um, it turns out it's iron that causes it. And this is really fascinating because we think that all the atoms that make up your body and mine, they are actually made in a star. And you might wonder, well, yeah, but if, if I was made in a star, if my elements were made in a star, how come I'm not in a star now? Easy. It's the iron. The iron is what makes a star explode. So imagine this, as all your atoms were actually sitting inside a star, just burning in different spots, and all of a sudden, that star ended up having iron in its core. And very, very quickly, once it has iron in its core, it can't push outwards anymore. It sort of can't even. So that means because it can't push outwards, all the gravity then causes everything to go inwards. And then so what can happen is um, it can squish everything and all that material will go in and then bounce off a solid surface, go boing, 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 and come out in a big supernova explosion. So it turns out, you know that iron that's in your blood? Like if you ever cut yourself and you taste that blood, for example, doesn't it taste a little bit like metal? That's that iron that's in your blood. We think that that iron that, that you're licking, you know, that iron that courses through your veins is actually what caused the star to explode and scatter those guts, those, you know, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, all those parts you need to make a human. I think it's kind of cool that we actually came from stars. But how do uh, stars make anything heavier than iron then? Well, that's when you need extra energy. So you need things like uh, extra energy and extra neutrons. For example, in the supernova explosion itself, then it can make like it can make all the extra stuff. But stars are happily burning and fusing all the way up to iron, no problem. Once it reaches iron, it blows up and then it makes the extras. So let's look at the final stages of a star's life. It all depends on the mass. Remember I said so if the remnant, if by the end of its life, if the mass of that star is less than 1.4 times the mass of our sun, now you don't have to know the word for this necessarily, but it's called the Chandrasekhar limit. So it, this is what's the Chandrasekhar limit. What it says is this is the maximum mass of a stable white dwarf. So anything less than that, you're fine. Anything greater than that, not fine. So our sun, for example, is going to be like this. So if we look at an HR diagram, our sun right here sitting on the main sequence, what is it going to do? Well, because it will, by definition, at the end of its lifetime, have a mass that's less than 1.4 times its mass now, of course it will, well, then this is what it's going to do. It's going to go up into, for example, the red giants here. So I'll maybe write that down. Okay, so our own sun is going to do that. And then it's going to do some weird stuff. Turns out it'll end up um, in this asymptotic giant branch. You don't need to know those details. But basically, it's going to make something quite pretty. Our sun is going to probably look something like this. This is a picture I took. Uh, this is actually called a dumbbell nebula. This is called a planetary nebula. But basically, our own sun will probably end up doing something like this. It's cool. It'll sort of just end up just letting go of some of its gases, and it'll heat them up. It'll be kind of pretty from far away. So our sun is going to become a red giant, and then... It's going to just kind of fizzle out and it's going to go down here to the white dwarf. Okay, so our sun is going to finish off as a white dwarf and it's going to kind of just like fizzle out and eventually it'll just, you know, disappear from this because it won't be emitting any light. Now, why is that? Well, that's because, remember, I talked about at the end when it runs out of uh, things to burn, you know, when it runs out, what's going to happen is this. It's going to stop being able to push outwards. So then you think, ooh, gravity is going to push inwards. But there is a limit to how much you can squish stuff. So it's actually called uh, electron degeneracy pressure, but you don't have to know that word, but just in case you want to look it up. But it's a, the, real, the idea here I want you to know about is that the electrons themselves, they can't be squished anymore. So it's something, it's a quantum mechanics thing about how uh, much you can squish things. So it turns out electrons can't be squished anymore, so they'll basically resist the inwards gravity. They'll resist it happily, just be fine. So that way it can't collapse anymore, it'll sort of stop collapsing, and it'll be a white dwarf. 
Now, what if it has a higher mass? What if the remnant mass is between 1.5 solar masses and 3? This is actually known as the Oppenheimer-Volkov limit. But this is really interesting what happens now. So now, remember before, in the other uh, limit, we talked about how, like with our sun, it won't be able to push outwards, true, but then these electrons will be able to kind of push outwards. So this, the, here's what's going to happen, though. In this case, the core is going to collapse, but it's going to have enough mass to actually break through those electrons. And then it'll basically make these neutrons. So it'll be neutrons that can't be squished anymore. And those neutrons will end up doing like this, like, I can't even right now. That means, you know, your star itself, it can't even, you know, push outwards. So it's the neutrons then that are going to provide that outwards push because radiation it won't. Now, the interesting thing is this. So we're, we're talking about like it probably reached iron very likely. So this one here probably got up to iron. And if it gets up to iron, what happens? Remember I was explaining it before? As soon as it has iron in its core, it has tons of mass to get to iron. But as soon as it has iron in its core, it can't burn anything and push outwards anymore. So what happens? All that gravity squishes. It squishes and crushes through the electrons. And the good news is, though, it does stop. The neutrons then can stop. It's called a neutron degeneracy pressure. So these neutrons are going to stop it. So it's going to squish until the neutrons basically harden. So imagine it all gets squished until it all makes like a big wall of neutrons. So all that mass that's been in free fall, falling down, it bounces off that solid neutron core. So it goes kind of boing, 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 bounces and comes outwards. And that's what a supernova explosion is. It's actually a core collapse that bounces off of a solid neutron core. So what happens then is this, the core will collapse, okay, sure, and then it'll create this big supernova explosion, so it'll explode, and in the end, what's remaining is going to be a neutron star. So what happens here, then, if I'm going to try to show this, high mass star, well, it'll probably go up into red supergiant, but what happens after that? Well, then it goes into explosion, it's basically a supernova explosion, and we don't see much of it after that. So that's the end result of uh, a star that has more mass than uh, our own. For example, well, has a, uh, the remnant mass is between 1.5 and 3 times the mass of our sun. Now, here's an interesting example of this. You don't have to know this, but this part right here by heart, but I think it's really interesting. There's something called the Crab Nebula. It turns out in 1054, Chinese astronomers were looking up in the night sky and they saw something that it was like it was a, a big bright spot in the sky. They said it was brighter than the moon for a bunch of days. So they, they're really good at mapping out where things were. They said, oh, it was really bright for this many days and it was right here in the sky. Well, we can be really thankful for them for being so careful because now we can actually, you know, train, we can look with our telescopes and see exactly where they said it was. So in 1054, there was, it sounds like to us, it was like, oh, that sounds a lot like a supernova, but how bright it got and how long it took to get less bright. We're like, that sounds like a supernova to us. So when astronomers could look with their telescopes, they see this. So this is what happens basically a thousand years after, uh, it was almost a thousand years. Um, after an explosion, this is the result. And this is in three dimensions, so it's, it's kind of hard to see, but there's this like big cloud, basically. So inside, there was this explosion, and all these different gases are being heated up in different ways. But what's kind of cool is that it's a good test of our physics, because we could say, oh, you know what? According to physics, if there was a neutron star, conservation of angular momentum says it's just like a, a spinning uh, skater, for example. If someone spins at, with their arms out and they end up bringing their arms in, what happens? You're going to start spinning faster and faster and faster. And the math goes that, hey, you know what? It should create a neutron star, and it should be spinning a few times per second. And it turned out this is so beautiful. When you really zoom in on this core part right here, like if you zoom in right to the left of this uh, little arc right here, right around here, for example, there is a neutron star. And it is spinning. It spins. It rotates 30 times per second. It is so cool. It's a really good example, I think, of like science coming in and being explained by what we saw in real life. My very last thing is what happens if the remnant has a mass bigger than three times the mass of our sun? Well, then even worse happens. It basically has enough mass. Remember, it stops pushing outwards. It has enough mass to crush through the electrons and the neutrons, and it kind of breaks space. It makes a black hole. 
And there's a lot of weird physics going on with that. If you've ever seen the movie Interstellar about how time changes as you're closer to a black hole, that part is actually true. So black holes are really weird. But basically, it all depends on the mass, doesn't it? So you need to know about these facts that if it has a low mass, it's going to finish as a well red giant and then a white dwarf. has a medium mass, then it can actually explode into a supernova. And if it has really high mass, it'll end up making a black hole.